When you think of a volcano, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Streams of red, steaming hot lava pouring over the sides? Dark clouds of ash rising high into the sky? Maybe you think of a relaxing hot spring. Ah, that's nice. Well, we all imagine one thing. A cone-shaped mountain looming over the horizon. But it can be as green and lush as any other mountain. At the top, of course, there's a giant hole. Like an opening that goes all the way down. Inside, there's lava and gases being pushed outside. Lava is so hot that if you were standing at the top of the volcano and looked down, your face would feel as red as the color of that liquid rock oozing out. A volcanic eruption never comes without consequences for us. And I'm not just talking about people living nearby. The impacts are usually felt on a global scale, too. Can't fly for a while because of the blanket of ash released in the air. Not to mention, it might be a bit tricky to breathe. Carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and plenty of other toxic gases whose names immediately take you back to your high school chemistry class. Funny enough, most of that cloud rising out of a volcano is just water. Well, vaporized from those scalding temperatures. But before any volcano erupts, it goes through stages like an angsty teen. First, magma. That's lava before it erupts onto the surface and gets its name change. Starts moving underneath the volcano. This causes earthquakes that get worse and more dangerous over time. Then, steam and different gases start spewing out of holes in the planet's crust. Our Earth resembles a tea kettle about to whistle. When the gas emissions and earthquakes get more massive, it usually means the volcano is about to blow its top. But those first stages can take years before an eruption happens. Then, the magma starts building up. With more and more pressure, it's planning to make its great escape. It's hard to notice this happening if you don't have the proper equipment. Good thing scientists do, and they've got us covered. The volcano becomes more active by the minute. Ash starts coming out and spreading in the air, creating ominous clouds that turn day to night. With the magma building up, an eruption is imminent. Then, boom! The surface gives in under the pressure below. The magma makes its exit. It's now lava spewing out the top and flowing down the sides of the mountain. None of this sounds very appealing. So what if it never happened? What if there were never any volcanoes at all? Would Earth still be the same? Not at all. If volcanoes never existed, there wouldn't be an atmosphere. When our planet was still just a young pup, volcanic gases are what created our protective bubble that allows you and me to breathe right now. They also played a big part in shaping the land and oceans. Four billion years ago, Earth was still forming. It didn't look anything like the pale blue dot we know today. It was red hot, and the water was trapped under the crust. It wasn't until the surface started to cool down and solidify that the water was finally able to escape. Volcanoes acted sort of like a tear in the fabric of our planet. Water vapor would condense in the atmosphere and then fall back down as rain. It rained for so long that the third planet from the sun started turning into the blue ball we're more familiar with. In fact, there's even a theory that all the water on Earth came from volcanoes. And without water, of course, life wouldn't have been able to form. Land formation went through a similar process. You see, our planet was a pretty rough place to be when it was forming. It was a molten surface, with fields of lava and constant volcanic eruptions and space rocks always crashing into it, because there was no atmosphere to protect it. When it started cooling down, a good solid surface formed. But the hot material underneath was still boiling and bubbling, and it continued making its way up. The crust would move and form thick layers with the material that was rising up. Over time, these layers became more permanent. Volcanic eruptions were still happening, but the first landmass had finally formed. Okay, we'll take the best part of volcanoes, an atmosphere. So what if they stopped erupting long after we got our protective breathable shield? Still not good. For starters, volcanoes created the most fertile soil. Around Naples, you have the famous Mount Vesuvius. The soil quality there is incredibly rich. 
And that's thanks to two huge volcanic eruptions. One that happened 35,000 years ago, and another 12,000 years ago. Sure, these volcanoes caused a lot of short-term damage. But in the long run, these soils were fertilized by them. Now the region grows all kinds of citrus fruits, olives, grapes, cherries, and of course, their staple, tomatoes. There'd be none of that without rich volcanic soil. And Naples is by far not the only example like this. Bacteria, the first living organisms, lived in hot water. Scientists have discovered fossilized microorganisms older than 4 billion years. They thrived in hydrothermal vents. Those are fissures on the sea floor, and they're usually near volcanically active places. This means that without volcanoes, we wouldn't have land, water, or even the first life forms that, as the theory goes, would eventually evolve into all the creatures we have today. Could life have still developed on Earth without these explosive mountains? Eh, doubtful. Okay, fair enough. We want our atmosphere and life. So let's say volcanoes stopped erupting today, after we already have all these benefits. Well, we're sort of already there, based on this story. At the start, there was only one continent, Pangaea. It was a supercontinent surrounded by one massive continuous superocean. Volcanic activity by this time had finally calmed down, and this meant all that energy would gather below the Earth's crust. Here's a little diagram. First, we have the Earth's inner core. Then there's the outer core. Next up, we have our convection currents. Magma is next in line. After that, the oceanic crust. And at the very top, we have our ocean and our continental crust. The reason Pangaea eventually broke up into the separate continents we have today is because of plate tectonics. It's not like the crust is all one solid piece. It's broken up into big chunks, or plates, that are always moving. And it's all still moving today. Yes, the land you're standing on right now is sort of surfing on that layer of convection currents. It's a slow process, so it's not like you can feel it. Pangaea didn't break apart all at once. It took tens of millions of years. When the plates move, they cause earthquakes and volcanic activity. They create mountains, too. It's good for our planet as well, because the Earth gets to sort of renew its old crust. If there was no volcanic activity now, the pressure underneath the Earth's crust would keep building up. It'd get to a boiling point the continents couldn't handle anymore. And eventually, they'd start splitting into more numerous and smaller masses. Volcanoes are still useful to us till this day. For one, they cool our atmosphere. Their eruptions release sulfur gas. It combines with water in our atmosphere and cools it at its lowest level which is where we live and breathe. There's also an excellent use for their heat. Geothermal power plants harness the energy coming from deep inside the Earth and turn its heat into steam. We then use that steam and turn it into electricity. This is the case for our friends in New Zealand and Iceland, since they live in places with high underground temperatures. Volcanic material can also be made into blocks for building stuff it can be grounded down to make cement, too. If we want, we can even search volcanoes for precious minerals like gold, copper, and sulfur. And who can forget about hot springs? Tourism to places like Yellowstone and Iceland wouldn't be the same without them. And who doesn't love a nice steamy dip in the ones safe for swimming? Oh, yeah. In the end, volcanoes aren't so bad after all our beautiful Earth wouldn't be what it is without them. So, you notice anything weird? Recently, there have been alarming changes in the water levels in different parts of Yellowstone Lake. At the same moment, the water level can be rising on one side of the lake and falling on the other. Ooh, it looks as if the lake basin gets lifted by some underground forces. Can it be a sign of a looming disaster? Geysers, mud ponds, and hot springs turn Yellowstone National Park into some extraterrestrial world. And all these wonders are fueled by a mighty supervolcano. Supervolcanoes produce super eruptions. When it happens, they launch more than 240 cubic miles of ash, molten rock, and hot gases up into the air. To make it easier to imagine, 
four super eruptions could fill the Grand Canyon to the brim. The Yellowstone giant was thought to be responsible for at least three enormous eruptions and countless smaller ones. In that region, the volcanic deposits are scattered over tens of thousands of miles. Scientists believe they had been created by many weak eruptions. But after doing more research, experts found out these deposits had been left by two previously unknown super eruptions. Those probably took place about 9 and 8.7 million years ago. This discovery means that the area around the Yellowstone volcano used to face a super eruption every half a million years. But over the last three million years, the hotspot has seen only two super eruptions. It makes scientists believe these catastrophic events are slowing down. Or just maybe one is overdue. Anyway, if the Yellowstone supervolcano went off with as much power as it had 2.1 million years ago, it would spit out more than 588 cubic miles of boiling lava. That's more than 4,500 times the volume of Sydney Harbor. That's a lot of lava. Whether it's likely to happen or not is another question. There's no doubt that something is going on with the volcano. The water level changes in Yellowstone Lake mean the caldera is lifting under the surface. And the caldera is what's left over after a volcano erupts and then collapses. The Yellowstone caldera is not just going up, creating a dome-shaped uplift. It also moves up and down in a kind of breathing motion. It might be because the magma is seeping into the crust, or because this magma is heating up the Yellowstone hydrothermal system, making it expand and raise the crust. Yellowstone has the status of an active volcano. Its volcanic explosivity index is 8 out of 10. Such a high number means that if this volcano erupted, it would be an apocalyptic event. Right before the disaster, the ground around the national park would lift. Geothermal pools and geysers would heat up to boiling temperatures and get more acidic than usual. The magma would start to rise toward the surface. At some point, the rock roof of the magma chamber wouldn't be able to resist anymore, and the explosion would kick off. A massive column of lava and ash would shoot up to a height of over 16 miles. After that, the volcano would keep pumping ash for days on end. The mixture of lava, ash, and gas would be hotter than 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. It would travel through the area at a speed of 300 miles per hour, faster than a racing car. The air near the center of the eruption would heat up to 570 degrees Fahrenheit. One of the most dangerous consequences would be ash fallout. Volcanic ash can turn into glassy cement within seconds after being inhaled and getting in the lungs. People and animals would have problems with breathing. OK, so that's an understatement, just so you know. Buildings would start to collapse under the weight of this dense substance. It would take just several days until a 10-foot layer of ash covered the territory of about 50 miles around the center of the eruption. After the ash got into the stratosphere, the temperatures all over the world would start to drop. If the eruption was rich in sulfur, an effective sun blocker, it would get so cold there would be no summer in the entire world for the next several years. The monsoon seasons would change. Agriculture would face serious problems. There would be issues with food supplies. Over the past 50 years, the Yellowstone caldera has risen almost two feet. It shouldn't alarm you, though. Experts are sure it's a natural behavior for Yellowstone. Periods of dome-shaped uplift are followed by the caldera lowering. Scientists think the supervolcano doesn't present any danger at the moment. For an eruption to happen, the magma inside has to be at least 50% molten. With Yellowstone, this number is just 5 to 15%. The probability of the eruption is 1 in 730,000. Safe to say, it's a long shot. Even better, a recent study made the researchers believe the hotspot might be in a state of decline right now, even despite all the breathing and dome-raising activity. Still, there have been tons of discussions about what people could do to prevent the disastrous supereruption from happening. And the most popular and seemingly effective idea was to cool the Yellowstone supervolcano down. Unfortunately, there's a catch. The volcano leaks out only 70% of the heat which comes from its magma-filled chambers. But the rest of the heat stays inside. 
As soon as it reaches a particular threshold, the volcano erupts. If it was possible to extract at least 35% of the Yellowstone volcano's heat, the eruption could be avoided. The cooler the magma is, the thicker and stickier it gets. It stops being so fluid and doesn't try to get out to the surface anymore. After considering these facts, NASA scientists came up with a plan. They suggested drilling a six miles deep well and pumping down cold, pressurized water. The temperature of the water that would get back to the surface would be approximately 662 degrees Fahrenheit. This way, the heat would be gradually extracted from the volcano. And if a geothermal plant was built on the site, it would generate plenty of electric power. It would be very simple to produce, and its price would be very alluring – about 10 cents per kilowatt hour. At first glance, it was an amazing idea. But sometime later, it started to receive a lot of criticism. Imagine drilling through the Earth's crust, getting deeper and deeper, and then wham-bam, you hit a hypothermal pocket. Uh-oh, get ready for a catastrophe! This can release gases that are likely to cause a series of super-powerful explosions. In the worst-case scenario, it may even trigger a full-scale volcanic eruption. Now, you already know about its catastrophic outcomes. From fountains of lava and avalanches of molten rocks to climate changes all over the globe. Yeah, not good. Or, let's say, you're drilling a well to deliver cold water to the volcano. And then, you suddenly hit its magma chamber. In this case, instead of cooling the giant down, you'll make the top of the magma chamber much more fragile than it used to be. And the whole construction will be at risk of collapsing at any moment. And don't forget that your drilling may also release toxic gases. They often accumulate at the top of the reservoir with magma. Can it get any worse? Well, yes it can! The whole process would stretch for more than 16,000 years. This method is too risky to cool the volcano down as fast as people would probably want. And scientists aren't even 100% sure that when the cooling system construction is finished, the volcano will stay cold for at least another 100 years. And last but not least, the project of making the Yellowstone supervolcano a bit cooler would cost a mind-boggling $3.5 billion. A huge price for something that might not work out altogether. Oh, by the way, Yellowstone isn't the only volcano that has a lava dome that's lifting at the moment. Lava domes are created when magma gets to the surface and then gathers around the vent. Scientists have found one of those inside an underwater volcano in Japan. This dome is more than 2,000 feet high and more than 6 miles wide. Even though the Japanese supervolcano seems to be sleeping, experts don't let their guard down. A volcanic system can go from being calm and docile to teetering on the edge of an eruption in the blink of an eye. Another massive dome is growing in the central Andes, on top of the planet's largest active magma store. The Altiplano Puna Plateau well, there's a tongue twister, and where the dome was found is the second highest plateau in the world, and the dome itself is more than half a mile tall. You might wonder how come experts have known nothing about this enormous uplift until recently. The answer is simple. It was hidden within the plateau. It's an arid region littered with volcanoes, and it stretches for thousands of miles. Yep, another case of hiding in plain sight. Have you heard about a diamond star that could put all the riches on Earth to shame? Or how about twinkling stars with surfaces made of solid iron? So let's take a look at these weird stars and try to unravel their mysteries. There's a star in the Centaurus constellation that was nicknamed Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Yes, it was named after a Beatles song, because it basically is a Beatles song. You see, the star was discovered to have a massive diamond at its core. Now, you may be wondering how big this diamond really is. Well, it's estimated to be about 10 billion trillion trillion carats. That's a 1 followed by 34 zeros. To put that into perspective, the Hope Diamond, which is one of the largest diamonds on Earth, is a measly 45.5 carats in comparison. Can you imagine the size of the ring you could make with this star diamond? And it's about the same mass as our sun. 
But don't get too excited about the prospect of owning this diamond just yet. Even if you were Jeff Bezos, you wouldn't be able to afford it. According to Ronald Winston, CEO of Harry Winston Inc., the diamond is so big that it would likely depress the value of the market. So you'd have to settle for a much smaller diamond engagement ring. One interesting thing about the Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds star is that it's incredibly dense. In fact, it has the mass of the Sun crammed into an object only a third the diameter of Earth. That's like trying to fit an elephant into a shoebox. And yet, despite its massive size, it's actually quite cool, with a core temperature of only about 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. By comparison, the core temperature of our Sun is about 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. Since the discovery of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, several other crystallized stars have been found, some with diamond hearts the size of Earth. It just goes to show that the universe is full of surprises, and you never know what kind of treasures you might find out there in the vast expanse of space. And this isn't the only weird star we've discovered so far. There are many strange, unexplained things in outer space. For example, let's take Vega. Vega, also known as Alpha Lyrae, is a bright star located in the constellation Lyra. It's one of the brightest stars in the night sky and is easily visible to the naked eye from most parts of the world. Now, Vega may look like a beautiful, bright star to us northern hemisphere folks, but little do we know, it's hiding a secret. It's actually quite squashed. You see, Vega's high spin rate causes it to bulge at the equator, kind of like a cosmic belly. It rotates once every 12.5 hours, which is pretty fast for a star, and it throws material out around its waistline. It's almost like the star is hula hooping. This material is further from the center of the star, so it experiences less gravity, causing it to cool and darken, leading to a gravity darkening effect. So Vega is basically a cosmic fitness guru's worst nightmare. Although for us stargazers, it still looks round because we're looking at it from Earth's pole end. However, if we saw it from a different angle, we'd get a very different view. One that might make us wonder if Vega has been sneaking some cosmic donuts behind our backs. But while we might joke about its equatorial waistline, there's no denying that Vega is still one of the brightest and most fascinating stars in our galaxy. But if you want something actually bright, then how about a supernova? Supernovas are giant space booms that occur when stars reach the end of their life cycle. It's like the grand finale of a fireworks show, but on a cosmic scale. They release more energy in a few seconds and our sun will produce in its entire lifetime. And this is exactly what happened to the next star of our show. This celestial object with a weird name, IPFT14HLS. But there's a catch. It isn't your average supernova. Even though this star made a blast in 2014 and started to fade away like usual, recently it made an unexpected comeback and brightened once more. <laughs> Talk about a dramatic entrance. And if that wasn't enough, this thing continued to fade and brighten at least five times in total, which is a bit like a yo-yo. It's like the star just couldn't make up its mind about whether it wanted to stay bright or fade away into the abyss. Also, when scientists measured the supernova's spectrum, they found that it was evolving 10 times slower than other stars. Maybe it's a supernova that just wants to enjoy its golden years. All in all, this object is a real mystery. But this is not the only star suffering from the 2-in-1 syndrome. At first glance, M.Y. Camelopardalis appears to be a fairly common star. But after a closer look, Astronomers concluded it was actually two stars in one. 
These two stars are orbiting each other at over 600,000 miles per hour. It's a contact binary star system, which means that the stars are so close together that they share a common envelope. In other words, they're so close to each other that they're practically smooching. These celestial Romeo and Juliet are one of the most massive known binary stars out there. Each of them individually weighs in at a whopping 32 and 38 solar masses, respectively. Astronomers also think that they might be on the brink of a stellar merger, which means that one day, they might just combine into one giant superstar. Wow, who knew space could be so romantic? Next, introducing another long name, HD 140283 also known as Methuselah's star. This little guy in the constellation Libra has been around for a while. And by a while, I mean a really long time. Actually, scientists used to think it was older than the universe itself. Just imagine if it turned out to be true. But eventually, they figured out that it's actually around 14.8 billion years old, a peer of our universe. That's still pretty impressive, though. This star is so old, it remembers when the Milky Way was just a baby galaxy. But despite all that, this star still has some life left in it. It's just starting to expand into a red giant, which is kind of like when you hit your 30s. Talk about aging well. But if all these things are somewhat comprehensible, then how about a star that was literally named WTF star by scientists. No, I'm not kidding. At least it used to be. Now it's called Tabby's star. It also has a more scientific name, but that one is a bit of a mouthful. But what's really bizarre about this star is its irregular dimming. For some reason, it doesn't glow like a normal star, but blinks, as if someone turned on and off a flashlight. And it's not just a little dip, we're talking up to a 22% drop in light. So it's not because it sometimes gets blocked by a planet or something. Scientists have come up with all sorts of explanations for this strange behavior, from comets to dust to even an extraterrestrial megastructure. That's right, but before your imagination runs too wild, it's important to note that the most likely explanation is just plain old dust. Perhaps the star is surrounded by some kind of dust cloud, and sometimes it prevents us from seeing it clearly. Although this explanation is still not 100% confirmed, there are still plenty of mysteries surrounding Tabby's star. One thing's for sure, it may be a bit of an oddball, but that's what makes it so fascinating. So, there you have it, folks. We're left in awe of the incredible diversity and strangeness of the cosmos. There's so much more to discover out there. So let's keep exploring and keep being amazed by the wonders of the universe. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.